50th anniversary celebration. Specifically, Karen Turner right here who came to my office and said, what would you like to do as a library program? So I said, well, Karen, there's this guy who hangs out at Hardy's and Saluda, <laughs> <laughs> making up stuff every day for several hours. How about that? And she said, great. So we invited Mr. Brad Parks, who's with us today. Um, just to quickly check my notes here, uh, while Mr. Parks has won numerous writer's awards, he's particularly proud of the following distinction, which he posted on his Facebook page in November, and I will read aloud from his Facebook posting. I always told people if they ever saw my book in Walmart, they would know I had really accomplished something as an author. Today, Say Nothing releases in mass market paperback. And guess who recently learned is going to be carrying it? <laughs> Walmart. 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 <laughs> and there it is. The next time I <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. What about movie rights? Yeah, I'm not sure about movie rights. Well, another distinction I can offer you is that in searching our library collection for Mr. Parks' works, I found an interesting distinction that I've never seen with any other American author. And I'll play it for you just a moment of that. Dan, they're all old people. They think they just can't hear right now. No, that's actually German. It's German. Oh, he, his book is an audio book in German, which I listened to driving here today, and in five minutes' time understood two whole words. <laughs> Shenandoah and Valley. And if you are German listeners, here's a great opportunity to spend 12 hours listening to one of Brad's books in German. Now, not every American author gets that distinction. So we have a very distinguished speaker with us today, Mr. Brad Parks. Brad, thank you for joining us here at RCC's 50th birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Dan, and here this whole time, I thought you only invited me because David Baldacci was busy. This is such an honor. Really, uh, no, I, I am uh, very much honored to be here. Actually, a funny story about that—the um, the German book he was holding up. The uh, the English title of that book is called "Closer Than You Know." Right? It's this very kind of soft, like you know, trouble is always closer than you know, disaster is closer than you know. Uh, the Germans took that and translated it into. Ich vernichte dich, which is German for I will destroy you. <laughs> That's how the German is. Uh, so it is, it is a great honor to be here. Yeah, I think when, when Dan first emailed me, um, I, like, I know this has been in the works for a long time, because when he first emailed me, I think it was like the 48th anniversary of RCC. Uh, you know, and it was like January 11th of 2020. I wouldn't even be alive then. Yeah, sure. I'll talk to your thing, no problem. Um, but it is a, a great honor to be here, and uh, in particular because I know how much RCC means to this community. Um, we first moved here in 2008, uh, which means we are now embarking on our third different decade uh, of affiliation with the, uh, the Middle Peninsula and Northern Neck. Uh, and I cannot imagine what this region would look like if it were not for RCC, to be quite honest. Um, the, the number of people you meet whose lives have been transformed by this <coughs> and whose stories intersect with RCC in one way or another, um, uh, it, it's, it's really incredible. And um, because, you know, we're, we're learning a lot about this economy we have now. And actually, like, our economy is, is terrific right now for some people, but not for everyone. And the people very much being left behind are the people who don't live near the interstate highways and who do live, and we were just talking about broadband internet, who don't live in areas with broadband internet access and who don't live in dynamic areas of job creation and population gain. I mean, the, there are places like the Middle Peninsula and Northern Neck that are being left behind. And that makes a, an institution like RCC such a, a, a vital link to, to get our, our younger people and even you know people in mid career who finally realize they need job training they need they need more skills uh, you know to give them that leg up and that possibility to to kind of continue their journey so I'm I'm just I'm very honored to to be able to celebrate uh, with you guys today this this momentous occasion um, I also I, I do have to apologize 
I have never given this exact talk before. Uh, so the only person who should be more nervous right now than me is actually all of you. <laughs> <laughs> because it, it could go very, very badly off the rails at any moment. I'm just, I'm just going to warn you. Uh, we are calling this the education of a writer. Uh, and we are calling it that because when Dan emailed me, I thought, 50th anniversary of RCC. I need to come up with something good here. You know, and so I came up with like, what would be a nice highfalutin title? Education of a writer. That sounds like very befitting the moment of, of the 50th anniversary of RCC. So that's what I went with, and then it suddenly occurred to me that means I have to give a talk about that. So um, I should say, uh, well, are, are any of you faculty members here in RCC? Just one. Okay, that, that's good because I'm sure I'm going to say a lot of things that would get me slaughtered in the faculty meeting uh, at <laughs> community college. Things that are imprecise, unexact, and just plain wrong. And I just wanted to announce that. Ahead of time. Um, so, and, 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 uh, fair enough. So, and, and bear in mind, it's education of a writer. Not all writers, just me. So this is my own kind of meandering experience and, and my own um, thoughts on writing and how writers are made and, and, and mostly based on, uh, obviously, my own experience with it. Um, so there's a great debate in the writing community. Are writers born or are they made? And like a lot of false dichotomies, you know, nature or nurture, or, um, you know, do we need a strong principal or do we need strong teachers? Well. You need both. I mean, it's nature and nurture. It's you know principals and teachers, and it's you know writers are both born and made. But within that dichotomy, uh, I really fall on the side of writers are made, really truly. Like, and I, I think honestly, if if you look at okay, we are in a country of 330 million people, and I would posit that roughly half of them have the minimum of uh, intelligence and uh, and just kind of raw horsepower to be able to do what I do. Um, to be quite honest. Like, I think yeah, as long as you are of average intelligence, guess what? You can write a novel. And I, I say this with certainty because I have a little secret to share with all of you. I am not that smart. I'm serious. I'm not, I'm not being falsely modest here or anything like this. Um, some of you know my wife. Uh, she is a school psychologist by training. And school psychologists, uh, one of the first things they do is they learn how to give intelligence tests. Right? And so, yeah, you, you know where this is going, right? So when my wife was in grad school, yes, I was her test dummy. <laughs> Way more literally than I ever would want that term to be applied. Um, so she, and she would give me all these tests, and she would always say that, well, the results aren't valid because I'm just learning how to give these tests, so they're not, but then as she'd be saying this, she'd be smirking at my answer sheet, like what, you know, or actually it would either be, she'd be smirking at it, or we were, we were newly married at this point, and she would have this like look of horror on her face, like, am I really going to procreate with this man? Like, is it, is it too late to call this thing off? Can we just send the wedding presents back? You know, uh, so my, my wife could, like, there was, there was this one test in particular, uh, I think it was for sixth graders, right? And you were given um, a set of blocks, and you had to like make the blocks look like the picture. And the deal was, uh, you got a certain score, not, not that I knew any of the following, you got a certain score if you could do it in one minute. I'm sorry, not if you, if the sixth grader could do it in one minute. <laughs> the sixth grader would get another score if they could do it in two minutes. Anything after that, you got no score, you got no points. but. The test administrator couldn't tell you how to, to stop, right? You got to keep doing it until you got it done. <laughs> 26 minutes later, I <laughs> nailed it. <laughs> so, so, but that's the beautiful thing about writing. You actually don't have to be that smart. You don't have to be that quick. You don't have to be that kid who can get it done in a minute. What you do have to be is that kid who's willing to sit there for 26 minutes, or for an hour, or two hours, or four hours, or just bang your head against the laptop screen until it comes out right. Uh, and if I have something I'm born with, that's it. It's, you know, so when, when we thought, you know, faculty member, when, when you're looking at who are, who are the kids who are going to be writers, don't necessarily look for your best and brightest students. Look for your stubborn students. Look for your students who just don't want to quit, because that's the thing with writing. You can just keep at it and keep at it and keep at it. So 
Um, yeah, so I, I'm not that smart. And um, the other thing I've, I've learned about writing is, of course, it's, it's very difficult, right? Um, and I think nobody really wants to write, truly. Like, writing is hard. It's, it's hard for me. It's hard for everyone. Like, there has to be a reason that you need to write. Um, and maybe you need to write because your professor has given you a, a, an assignment. Or, you know, a, a, on a higher plane, maybe you need to write because you have some story burning inside you that just has to get out. Or maybe you need to write because suddenly you're, you're, you're looking at the paper and about every other week or so, you're seeing one of your high school classmates in the obituaries, right? And you're realizing, I'm not really going to be around that much longer. And eventually, all that's going to be left of Grandpa is, you know, that box of ashes. And if I am finally able to write that book that I've always wanted to write. Like, that's a need to write. Um, for me, the need to write uh, first arose because of, well, so now it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, my children are um, young, hungry, and I have no other marketable skills, all right? So that fueled a need to write. But, but back when I first started, uh, my need was driven by the 1988-89 Ridgefield High School girls basketball team. You may find this hard to believe, uh, but when I was 14 years old in the fall of 1988, uh, I was not quite the bearded hottie, <laughs> <laughs> the paragon of malehood that I am, the great, the great spe ma male examples of the species. Um, I was short, I was fat, I had braces, I had this high squeaky voice, like my voice hadn't changed when I was still a freshman in high school, but I figured that if I was covering the high school girls basketball team for the local paper, they would have to talk to me. <laughs> and then I'd be able to get dates. And then maybe possibly, most audaciously, I wouldn't still be a virgin come senior prom. Right? This was, this was the, the grand master plan. Yeah, so I very quickly learned that not all of my writing goals would be achieved. Uh, but I started covering that high school girls basketball team for my local weekly paper in Richfield, Connecticut not unlike the Rappahannock Record, who is well represented today, thank you Rappahannock Record, <laughs> or, you know, like, I guess the Southside Sentinel, they, they, they're not going to send their own person with, with you guys here, so, you know, but, but this little weekly paper, and, you know, it's a funny thing about these little weekly papers, and don't let this go to your head, Rappahannock Record, but <laughs> people read those things. You better be darn sure people read those things, and so for me, as this 14-year-old kid, it's like, all of a sudden, people are reading me? People would like quote my stories back to me. This was a heady, amazing thing to have happen. And what I discovered very quickly is that writing, okay, I, I can't say I loved to write, because again, writing is so hard. Who would love that? But I loved being read. You know? And I think this is another important thing for writers. Um, and, and, and in the education of a writer, like figure out as a writer, what does give you pleasure? out of this very difficult process. Like this, this thing that like, we all struggle with so much, but it, is there something that I do find really rewarding about it? And you know, maybe that's internal. Maybe that's you know, being able to look at this thing when I'm all done and say, hey, that's pretty good. But you know, for me, it was external. It was like I loved being read. And so it kind of set me on this path, and I, and I think a lot of young writers have this, where you, you kind of like get these moments now and then, these little milestones, these things that happen to you that, that tell you you're on the right path. And maybe that's like the first time someone tells you that something you wrote made them cry. Like, oh, wow. You know, the first time something you wrote really pisses someone off. <laughs> like, that's a wonderfully important thing to have happen in writing. Like, actually, I was, I was making fun of Sissy Crowther um, in there. Uh, and I, I was going to, if she was here, I was going to make fun of her in person. Uh, because I, I, you know, <laughs> Sissy is, of course, such an enormous part of this institution and, and so huge in, in, in the building of RCC into what it is. Um, and, and she continues to be an inspiring leader because I, I recently heard she went to the Holly Ball and gave a keynote speech about the responsibilities that come with privilege and how being, having a privileged upbringing in, endows you with, with the necessity to do things to help others. 
give that speech at a debutante's ball. I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> like, wow, that's, you know. Um, but, but yeah, so like, you know, something that, 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 that creates an uproar. Or, um, I mean, just, just, or, you know, certainly as, as a young writer, if, you know, if, if ever you, you, you trip across a young writer, encouragement to a young writer can be the biggest thing. I mean, just even, look, even if you have to lie to them, okay? You say, hey, that was pretty good. Or you, you pick, you ignore the 14 things they did badly. Um, like, you know, for example, I, I flunked two grammar quizzes here today. You know, like, okay, my grammar wasn't great, but like, you find the thing that, that really worked. And, and you say, gosh, I really enjoyed that. Like, that means the world to that dumb writer, for sure. Um, so I, I kept having all these experiences. Um, and then I, I went to this wonderful school called Dartmouth College. Uh, and I know, immediately you're thinking, now wait a second. You said you weren't that smart. How did you get into Dartmouth? I wrote my way in. To be quite honest, uh, it was it was really my essays, and and in particular, and it's funny how the vagaries of life work. The person in the admissions office, I later learned, who gave my application a first read was a former member of the Dartmouth College women's basketball team, <laughs> and I had submitted these clips of my writing of covering the Richfield High School girls basketball team over the years. I was in, baby. I mean, you know, like, like, never underestimate the role of luck in 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 all of these things, right? So, um, so there I am at Dartmouth, and, I, and I'm, I'm this sports writer, right? And I was taking this freshman seminar, and I, I, I only tell this story because we are in this college setting, and, and I, I would imagine, I was imagining there was going to be more than one faculty member here. So you're, you're it, so you have to spread the word. Um, but uh, I, w I was taking a seminar, and the professor said the last thing you ever want to hear uh, when you're sitting in a seminar after you just turned the paper in which is, uh, Brad, can you come see me in my office? I want to talk to you about your paper. <laughs> and you're like, oh, God. Like, you know, like, I was worried, like, had I, had I mistakenly plagiarized? What I, you know, what, you know, what a horrible thing had I done? And instead he took me aside and he said, hey, I can tell you're a writer. What, what are you talking about? I, I just write sports articles and stuff like that. He says, no, 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 no. And this was the beautiful thing. And maybe it's because I'm not that smart. But he really distilled writing down to its essence for me. He said, no, writing is just taking the thoughts from your brain and getting them down on page. That's all it is. And you've clearly practiced that a lot. And it was, you know, one of those light bulb moments. There's nothing like somebody who can explain something simply and beautifully to you in that way. And, I, and I've come to, like, appreciate, like, I mean, that is, like, if everything Brad Parks knows about writing, if you just, you know, write up, that's it. That's all it is. It's articulating thoughts from your head to the page. But I think what happens is, when you first start out as a writer, there's this thick filter between your head and the page, right? You kind of know what you're thinking, but God, how do you say it, and how do you get it down, and you don't know. But this magic thing is the more you start writing, the more you write, the more you exercise that muscle <coughs> that is trying to get the stuff from here to the page, that filter thins out, and it thins out, and it thins out, until eventually it disappears. It just takes a long time to get there. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell, uh, who came up with the, you know, the 10 years or 10,000 hours, <clears throat> I'm very much a believer in that because I started writing professionally when I was 14, and I swear I didn't write a sentence worth a damn until I was 24. So yeah, it, it, 10 years, right about on schedule. So I, you know, so I was kind of in the middle of um, in, in this journey as a writer, and, and, and kind of these things kept happening to me that, that pointed out just the, the power of writing and the power of stories, right? Um, and I'll, I'll just like pick one story to tell you today because again, it's a, a story I, I haven't really told a lot. Um, but it, uh, it deals with a class that I took in my senior year. It was called Geography of Southeast Asia, right? What a good highfalutin sounding college name, Geography of Southeast Asia. Great class, okay, fine. So uh, the final project for Geography of Southeast Asia was to find somebody who had an experience of Southeast Asia and write a paper about them. Okay, great. Um, my dad was a Vietnam veteran. I think that's an experience in Southeast Asia. Great. So I call up my dad. I'm like, hey, dad, um, I need to write this paper. Can, can you talk to me about Vietnam? Now, at this point, I, I, should, I should tell you that my dad had actually never been really talked about Vietnam. Like, my dad and I were close. We could talk about baseball, politics, girls, whatever. And Vietnam was, was just not something he spoke about. Um, you know, like, I think the... The most I ever heard him say about the military was uh, every Memorial Day, my town would have a Memorial Day parade, and the World War II veterans would get all dressed up, and my father would just kind of fold their arms and sneer at them. 
look at those assholes parading around. What, because they won their war? You know, like that was all I ever heard my dad talk about. So I'm like, okay, fine. So um, my dad says, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll talk about this, but I, you know, I'm not going to do it over the phone. I'll come up for the weekend. So my dad came up for the weekend, and uh, I had to record this, right? And so I, I had one of these clunky old tape recorders. This is the mid-90s. We, I think there are no children in here, so we all remember this. You know, so I, I hit record and play on the tape recorder. And for the next three hours, my dad just talked. I think I asked the man six questions the whole time. He talked and talked. He talked about things he had never talked about before, things I didn't know. So like, he told me about um, when, he, when he first landed in country. And um, he was... Um, he was meeting with the battalion commander for the first time, and here, there he is. He's, he's fresh out of ROTC, you know, a first lieutenant, uh, and uh, he's kind of like next in line. The battalion commander says, hey, I need a guy uh, heading up A battery and B battery. Uh, which one do you want? And my dad said, oh, I don't know. You just you know, pick something. He said, well, you seem like a good guy. I need someone in A battery. You're going to A battery. The guy in line behind him was sent to B battery. Two weeks later, that guy was killed by a sniper standing in, in the exact spot where my dad would have been standing. Or another time, he told me about how he was, he was sitting in his hooch, in his tent, whatever you want to call it, um, and he, he kind of had bad posture, and he was writing a, a, a letter to the, um, the hot young sorority girl who would later become my mother, uh, and he's writing her letter, kind of hooched over, and all of a sudden he hears this crack! And then he looks up, and right here and here, there are two bullet holes in the tent, right? Um, he did get a purple heart while he was there. He got a you know mortar attack and he, he, he bled. So that's that's you get a purple heart. Uh, and so he just he told me about like that, but but also like boring times where like months would go by, nothing would happen. Or you know what what's it like to have Thanksgiving dinner uh, as meals ready to eat? Or you know to be sharing your quarters basically with a bunch of rats? And oh my God, how much they they you know had had the, like half the war for him was against the rats, not against the Viet <laughs> Cong. You know and all this kind of stuff. So so I wrote this paper. And, uh, of course, I, I sent it to him uh, and, you know, thought nothing else about it. But then this funny thing started happening. My dad, who had never talked about Vietnam to anyone at all, started sharing that paper with everyone he knew. He started looking up his old platoon mates. He started, like, sending this to relatives he hadn't spoken to in years. It was like, it was, you know, you, you talk about, the, like, the power of stories and, and, like, how much story can matter to someone. But, but being able to put that story in the right way, and it was like that I had done that for him. Um, and uh, it was, it, 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 this was all happening in a time in my life where I'm, I'm this young man, I'm, I'm a senior at Dartmouth College, and all of my friends are going off to be uh, investment bankers, or they're going off to med school, or they're going off to law school, and, and what do I want to do with my life? And it was, it was the kind of thing that made writing feel like it was a calling, like it was something I was really meant to do. Uh, all right, so I so this is you know the education of a writer continues, and I and I kept like having these experiences where I saw how powerful stories were to people uh, in in ways big and small. I mean, and I covered some huge events as as a newspaper reporter. Uh, you know, 9/11. I was still a sports writer at that point in time, and um, but well, sports ceased to exist uh, as of uh, seven whatever it was that morning. Uh, and so, you know, I ran the office, and they assigned me to write what they called a tone poem, which in the business is like, step back, and what the hell is going on here, and, and try to make sense of this. And I was kind of, I already had a reputation as being a guy with heavy fingers, as they said. So, like, you know, like, basically, this kid, go right to hell out of this. Like, well, and what do I do? And, oh, by the way, uh, we're coming out with a special edition this afternoon. So you've got four hours <laughs> to make sense of, like, the most, uh, up to that point, astonishing historical event of my lifetime. So I, you know, I left the office. I didn't know what else to do. I, I, I knew I couldn't write it in there. And I started kind of wandering around. Um, and eventually I was out in the New Jersey Turnpike because I was right, working for a paper in New Jersey at that point. And all good Jersey stories should happen in the New Jersey Turnpike. And uh, there was this guy who kind of pulled over to the side of the New Jersey Turnpike. And he was just leaning against the concrete barrier watching this smoldering hole of lower Manhattan, you know, because everything was still on fire and everything like that. So I, I kind of pulled over and I said, um, sir, what are you doing? And he said, I'm thinking of how to explain this to my seven-year-old. And that became the story I wrote that day. How do you explain evil to a seven-year-old, right? And it, 
it was another one of those moments where you're like, wow, the need to be able to tell a story about what is happening is so powerful. Or uh, another big event I covered, uh, Hurricane Katrina, um, which started off as being a weather event, by the way. Like, I thought I was going down to cover a hurricane. And so, like, hey, this seems like fun. And, you know, like, like let's get in the car and let's go until you, you, you get down there and, and suddenly you realize, I'm covering a humanitarian crisis here, right? And I, I finally worked around to where I had gotten to the spot where um, it was an exit ramp. Uh, and there were state policemen with guns, and uh, they said, oh, you're press? Okay, you can, you can go down that exit if you want to, but we can't guarantee your safety. Uh, and that was the one exit ramp that was the way in and the way out to the convention center, which had become a spot where about 20,000 people were uh, cordoned. Uh, you know, the, I, people didn't realize this at the time, but like, people, you know, there, there's like, well, why don't they just leave? Well, because there had been looting in the suburbs, and those state troopers with guns weren't letting people leave, right? So, all right, I go down the exit ramp, and um, 20,000 people, they are hungry, they are angry, um, and I, uh, I don't apologize for bringing race into it. This is just, this is the fact of the matter. All 20,000 of those people were black, and I'm not, right? So, and that was very much the, what was going on in that moment, because the people who suffered in Hurricane Katrina were not the people who had big SUVs, who could get the hell out of town, who could go stay with their relatives in Houston, right? They were the people who had been in the South Ward, in the Ninth Ward, for their entire lives, who didn't have cars, who didn't know anybody who had a car, who they couldn't get out, and they, and they were trapped there by those guys with guns, right? And um, so I, I go down there, and the, the first thing I see is like, you know, six tough, young-looking guys sitting on a gutted-out police car. I mean, it was like the very image of the defiance of authority, right? This thing, the tires had been popped, the windows had been bashed in, you know, and they're kind of looking at me like, you know, like, what are you going to do about it, white? You know, like, all right, <laughs> fine. Uh, but then I, when I got in there, like this in incredible thing happened. Um, I didn't know what the reception was going to be, and it couldn't have been warmer. Before I knew it, I had people leading me around by the hand. Here, talk to this man. He's, he's 85, and he's diabetic, and he hasn't had his insulin. And here's this woman, she's, she's pregnant, and all she had is, is a bag of Cheetos, right? So these people were poor, but they weren't stupid. They understood that they were in a bad, bad spot, and the only way that that was gonna change is if the rest of America got as outraged as they were, and that I was the conduit to the rest of America at that moment, right? Um, and so it was another time when I saw just how, how, how powerful stories could be. And so this is, you know, the education of a young writer we're talking about here. And I, and I kind of started digging deeper around that time of like, what is going on here? What is so powerful about our stories that we share, that we, we feel this? Like, you know, you, you become aware of like, you know, my, my grandfather uh, was dying of Alzheimer's at that point in time. And that man did not know my name, but he still knew some of his old stories, right? Like, what is so powerful about these things? And so I, uh, I began, and this is, this is now the highfalutin part that you can take back to the faculty room if you would like. Um, <laughs> but I, I began getting deep into, okay, like, who, who are we as a species, right? And if you, if you really study Homo sapiens, we're actually not great shakes when you get right down to it, especially if you compare us to the other hominid species that were once upon a time running around this planet. Like, Neanderthals had bigger brains than we did. They were, they were better bone structure. They were more muscly. Homo erectus walked better than we did. Uh, they probably, had they lived, they'd be a lot taller than us right now. Uh, like, what was it about us that made it? Like, and, and, and there was a long time where, where people were, where anthropologists were really struggling to, okay, we know from the, 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 the fossil record, from the anthropological record, that about 60,000 years ago, humanity came pouring out of Africa, right? With all this art and culture and technology, and, and we like took over the globe. We we had gotten everywhere in the globe within about twenty thousand years, which is an astonishing thing. No species had ever done it. Right? But what what was it that happened sixty thousand years ago? Um, so this is you know Brad's theory of everything. Um, <laughs> there was a group of researchers uh, in England who were studying this family, this very curious family, that even though they were of average intelligence. Uh, they had lost the ability to speak. They could just grunt at each other. What is going on with this family? Like this, this kind of weird mutation. Um, and they started, so they sequenced their DNA and everything like that. And it actually turns out they didn't have a mutation. 
they've actually lost an important mutation that all of us share, and that is FOXP2, which is, as you all know, well on the, the end of the seventh chromosome, um, right next to the heart. It's like, I, okay, I don't know where FOXP2 is, right? But, um, yeah, this is, thank God, you're not a biology teacher, are you? All right, I'm gonna, all right, I'm gonna skate by on that one. This is, you know, this is what storytellers do, right? So, so yeah, FOXP2, we have, all of us have this mutation on, on the, in one protein strand on our seventh chromosome called FOXP2 um, that is also shared by songbirds. Songbirds have the FOXP2. So it seems to be involved somehow in being able to modulate our voices up and down and left and right, and therefore they, they posit very possibly that this is what allowed us to have language that we weren't just grunting at each other anymore. We suddenly could talk to each other. We could tell each other stories, right? And it's this remarkable thing they can do with mitochondrial DNA. Again, I don't understand it at all. Thank God all the bio people are you know, off with that little cadaver thing, whatever that is. <laughs> Anyhow, um, they dated. When did that mutation occur? Well, surprisingly, about 60,000 years ago. Right? So this appears to be the big game changer. Because stories, like you, you come to realize, like they can be they can take all sorts of shapes and forms, and they can be as little as a funny story about how my wife knows I'm dumb, or they can be huge. They can be stories about a God we all believe in. And because we all believe in this God, we are going to build cathedrals and we are going to build pyramids and we are going to do this. Or the story can be about, nobody thinks that this is a story, but this stuff, this green, stupid piece of paper, if I hand to Bob, he's going to be really psyched. No, I'm not doing it, Bob. I'm not a writer, right? But like, that Bob thinks this has value, and I think it has value, is all based on a story we tell ourselves. We tell ourselves this has value, right? And you think about the entire complexity of our economy is all based on that story, you know? And so really, like, everything that we have accomplished as a species, which is so remarkable to us, is really all predicated around the stories we tell each other and the stories we all believe in. So for me, as a young writer, like, I kind of realized that, like, it almost felt like I had been gifted this very important responsibility to tell society's stories. Um, and unfortunately, at this point, another thing was happening within the global economy, and that is the newspaper I was working at, like many newspapers, thankfully not the Rapid Record, but larger newspapers, daily newspapers, the newspaper was dying. Um, and I was in my early 30s at that point, and we had one kid and another on the way, and it was very clear this thing was not gonna last. And so my wife and I kind of like, so what are we going to do about this? And um, so what we decided was that I was going to quit my job and become a novelist. Who does that? <laughs> Honestly, the stupidest idea you could possibly have. And that she was going to get a job at a boarding school. Because at a boarding school, you get to live on campus rent-free. And rent-free is about what a new author can afford. Right? Uh, and so that is how she found Christ Church School, this little school in Middlesex County, Virginia. I still have this, like, really firm. Now, I am originally from Connecticut, uh, you know, schooled in, in New Hampshire. Um, most of my formative years after that were in New Jersey. And what the heck is this place, right? Like, I, still, I have this firm memory of, like, Passing that Middlesex County founded in 16, blah, 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 you know, and, and also, by the way, passing the Hardys right behind it. <laughs> Little did I know how central a role that Hardys <laughs> play in my life. For those of you who don't know, that's where I do most of my writing. So, you know, like, so, you know, and then, and then like, you know, kind of all these fields and, and what's going on here. But yeah, that, that was how we, um, we ended up at, in Middlesex County and how I ended up being a novelist. Um, now, I'll speed up the story at this point because I, I, I don't want to bore you with, 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 with many uh, uh, more volumes of, of information. But basically, you know, at that point, I, I learned, I knew how to write. Like, I knew how to turn phrases and create sentences and, and whatnot. Um, what I didn't really know how to do was how to write a novel. Uh, and that's really kind of what I spent the next years doing. Um, and it was, uh, 
If I call it a trial and error process, let's lean more heavily on the error part, please, because there were a lot of errors. Because I, you know, I, I came out with my first book, and, um, and it was this nice little book that won some nice little awards. Um, and then my next book came out, another nice little book that won some nice little awards, but I wasn't getting any attention from my publishing company whatsoever. It's like, what is going on here? Um, so I, uh, I kind of started to, to understand the business a little bit better by then, and uh, finally I, I figured out that, that I needed to get myself a really high-powered agent, right? And so I went and got, you know, fanciest New York agent I could find, and all right, and I said, so what's going on? Why are my books not getting much attention? And he said, well, you know, he kind of explained the way the world works of like, hey, you start at a certain spot and you don't really grow from there unless, young man, you write a standalone novel. If you write a standalone, this will allow us to change the narrative a little bit and, and we, can, we can say this is something new and different. So write a standalone and make it just the best book you possibly can. Um, now, if you ask people in your publishing, what are you looking for? They always say the same thing. They say, I'm looking for a big book. <laughs> <laughs> what, what does that mean? Right? Um, well, I, I sort of thought I kind of knew, so I, I started writing, and I, I actually I called the Microsoft Word document that I was working in the big book. <laughs> doc, doc, right? So, um, so this was a big book. I mean, it had, like, I mean, explosions and tainted milk and <laughs> cults and uh, it ended with the president of the United States uh, bringing a missile strike down on Reedville okay <laughs> come on we've all wanted to blow up Reedville <laughs> right you know I mean, it kind of stinks sometimes whatever. Anyway. Uh, and I sent it off to my fancy New York agent and he said well this is good um, but it doesn't have heart and if it's gonna be a big book it needs to have heart so we kind of kicked it around for a little while until we, got, we reached the very difficult decision to throw the book away. 110,000 words, flush, gone. All right, but I'm not dissuaded because I'm that kid who spent 26 minutes trying to put the damn puzzle together, right? I'm back at it, okay. Uh, so I wrote another big book. Um, this one was set in Matthews County. Um, also, you know, all sorts of intrigue and, and whatnot. Um, and I, I finally sent it off to my fancy agent, uh, and he called me up and he said, well, this is good. It has heart, but it doesn't have twists. And in order to be a big book, you really need to have more twists. And so we kicked it around for a while, and um, again, reached the conclusion that we needed to throw the book away, 110,000 words flush. I told you this was more about error than it was about trial. So. Uh, like the, you know, now this is the the first book I threw away. I, I was pretty good with it. Like I was, I, like I, I didn't think I was going to get this right the first time. The second book I threw away. Um, I always say that the uh, the first time I saw my dad cry was when his father passed away. The first time my children saw me cry was when that book passed away. Right? <laughs> so fine. So, but I am not deterred because I am stubborn and as all get out. And so I wrote another book, um, and I sent it to my fancy New York agent, and he called me up and he said, "Well, this is good." It has heart, and it has twists, but all the characters are jerks. <laughs> and nobody really wants to spend 400 pages with a bunch of jerks. So again, we reached the very difficult conclusion to throw the book away. Uh, this time I dealt with it in an incredibly mature way, and that is I snapped at my children for no reason, stormed out of the house, went to the food line just up the street here, bought a box of cookies, and ate it in the car with tears streaming down my eyes. <laughs> Absolutely how you're supposed to deal with your feelings, I'm quite sure of it. Um, so again, I sat down to write the big book. Again, I, I told you that like the need, it's not a want, to, like you need to do this, right? Because again, I, I have no other means of support, so this is it. I need to do this, fourth time. And um, I wrote another novel, and I, this one was, I, I was actually, I still remember where I was when I, uh, when the idea for this came to me, and I'm, I'm going to tell Bob about it because Bob knows it very well. You've entered Christ Church School, you're going on down toward the duck farm, and like you've just kind of come out of where the, the trees, so you, you're now in the clear, and the road bends just to the right, and you're heading toward Best Boatyard, 
I picked up my right leg, and by the time I put it down, I went, oh, I got an idea, right? And this was, um, it was about a judge whose children were kidnapped by somebody looking to control the outcome of a case he is hearing. Uh, and that book became Say Nothing, which is now available in Walmart. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. But, so now this is where, I'm, okay, so the education of a writer continues, though, because uh, do, remember how I mentioned luck and how important luck was? Um, now, you would think a guy who wrote a book like that, it was... Uh, uh, Named one of the best books of the year by Library Journal. Named one of the best books of the year by Kirkus Reviews. I got these wonderful glowing reviews, everything like that. Like, clearly, I should have driven up today. No, I should have been driven up today. Uh, and I should be making a large donation to Rappahannock Community College for its 50th anniversary, right? Well, no, that didn't quite happen. Uh, because when did that book first come out? And when a book first comes out, that's the moment when if it's going to catch fire, that's when it's going to happen. Well, March of 2017. What was happening in March of 2017? Oh, it was the first 100 days of the Trump administration when basically people who read were all running around with their hair on fire, right? <laughs> sure that, that the republic was falling down. I mean, that was, you know, that was the moment we were in. Nobody was talking about books. Nobody was reading. Uh, anything other than, you know, the New York Times to go, oh, my God, what has he done now, right? <laughs> um, and so that book, I mean, while it did well, it didn't do what it was supposed to do. Um, and so I'm still that kid with the puzzle pieces trying to figure out how it all works. But the beautiful thing about being a writer, and this is where I, I kind of tie things back around to Rappahannock Community College, is you get to keep learning. The education of a writer always, always continues. Uh, Phoebe James has a, a great saying that uh, nothing that happens to a writer is ever wasted, right? And I, and I think it's, it's particularly apropos to share here because we all know Rappahannock Community College is a place where, you know what, not every kid at age 18 is mature enough to go to college or figures out that they need to go to college. And Rappahannock Community College is here whether they figure that out at 28, 38, 58, 98, whatever, that, you know, like, we're going to help you no matter where you are in that journey. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, and because nothing that writer ha happens, and, and this is actually, I'll, I'll, I'll conclude with this anecdote, because it involves Rappahannock Community College, uh, fortunately enough. So I was now thinking about the book that would follow up from Say Nothing. Um, and I, I, I always kind of had in my, in, in my thoughts a, a book set in the world of social services. That seemed like a very rich milieu. And, um, and you know, particularly the fact that, you know, actually, according to the laws of Virginia and every other state in the union, you know, there is a, an agency of government that has the authority to take your children from you. Like, and wow, what, a, what an incredible power that is, especially if it was abused. And that's where the thriller element comes in. So somebody who's manipulating social services to steal someone's child. Okay, this is good, right? Uh, so I, so I, I'm kind of cogitating on this book and whatever. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm living my normal life and going to Food Lion all the time. You know, because I do most of the shopping in my family. This is a little dirty secret about being an author. But when you're an author, it sort of can look a little bit like unemployment most of the time. <laughs> uh, so your wife does not have a lot of sympathy when she is working a, a full-time job that keeps her tied down from X to X. Like, you're the one going to the grocery store. Okay, so fine. Uh, so at the grocery store, I had, uh, I had met this young woman at the checkout stand because I was in there every darn day. My kids are hungry, whatever. Uh, I'll call her Melanie because that's what I end up calling her in the book. So, uh, you know, Melanie and I would just kind of chat as she's, you know, checking me out and whatever. And I you know, got to know her a little bit. And she seemed like, you know, bright young woman, good head on her shoulders, you know, dependable. She was obviously showing up for work all the time. So one day I asked, hey, Melanie, do you ever babysit? She says, oh, yeah, sure, I babysit. So she became my babysitter, right? Great. So uh, I was coming home from writing one day from parties. And um, I was doing something, and she was still, like, she and the kids were talking. And I heard one of my kids ask her, well, Miss Melanie, um, do you have any brothers and sisters? And she said, oh, yes, I've had 20 or 30. You know, and that's one of those like record scratch moments. You're like, okay, uh, Daddy needs to start paying attention. <laughs> what the hell is going on? Um, it turns out Miss Melanie had grown up in foster care, and I was like thinking about this.
book set in social services, and about, you know, my protagonist would be this young mother whose baby was taken away from her, and this would be the social services nightmare, and the light bulb goes on, what would be better than to have that young mother be someone who was a product of the foster care system herself? Right? She would know all the horrors, and she would know, like, oh my god, this is amazing. And so uh, I said, hey, Melanie, do you, you mind if I talk to you about your experiences in foster care? And like, so yeah, I, I took her to something different, and we, we sat down, and she started kind of telling me her story about how, um, you know, uh, basically her father beat the hell out of her mother, uh, and then her mother would go to the doctor and have pain pills subscribed to her, or prescribed to her, and the mother got hooked on pain pills, right? Uh, and then, it, you know, this kind of vicious cycle of she would kind of get off the pills and then dad would beat her up again and she'd get the pain pills again, she'd get hooked again and whatever. And, well, um, th this family was known to social services, as they say. And uh, one day, Melanie's baby brother uh, was found crawling out near Route 360 in nothing but a diaper. And so social services said, okay, Melanie's mother, um, here's the deal. You either divorce this guy who has been beating you or we're taking your children from you. Uh, and you wouldn't believe this unless, of course, you had worked with abused women. She chose the guy over her kids. Right? And this was Melanie. This happened to her when she was nine years old. And I was, I was kind of blown away because, God, here was this, this young woman who was so put together, who had such a good head on her shoulders, who was, she was working and everything like that. And, like, that resilience, I was just so floored by. And so I, I, I put that in my character, and I made that, the, this is closer than you know, or as my German friends like to call it, ich vernichte dich. Um, and uh, so I kind of like used that uh, as the basis for Melanie. But now here's where, okay, put fictional Melanie aside for a moment, and, and now real life Melanie. Um, real life Melanie eventually got uh, adopted by a family and um, was a, a good student and wanted to go to college someday. But the family that had adopted her was not of means, and she couldn't afford really anything because she worked at Food Lion, and she had no other money coming in except for Rappahannock Community College. So this was the only thing here for her. Like, the, Judge McKenney was talking earlier today about, oh, it's not a... It's a first choice, it's not a second. No, this was her only choice. This was it. And so she went to Rappahannock Community College, and I'm proud to say she is now about to graduate from Virginia Tech. So, one of those great stories. So, happy anniversary, Rappahannock Community College. So 50 much. years. And here's your Thank you, Brad. Yeah. So Very much. I'm happy to sign books, answer questions, whatever you Exactly that. The library will reopen in about two minutes. Because <laughs> my staff is now running over there to unlock the door. And Brad will be there to autograph books. We have a few books for sale. Or if you brought your own, that's fine. Or if you just want to say hi, please come over and say hi to Brad. Can you sing for two minutes? Come on. Come on. Can I sing for two minutes? <laughs> so yeah, so people, yeah, you can, you can go. No, I, <laughs> all right. So, <laughs> no, this was by request. Okay, I did not do this. Right. All right. But Avis, see, you're gonna think Avis is an audience plant now, right? No. <clears throat> it turns <laughs> out. Okay. So it turns out I actually have an audition coming up. For uh, we, you know, we're we're renting a place down in Williamsburg right now, so my kids can go to school down there. And so I am I have an audition with the Williamsburg Players at the end of the month. And so actually, you guys are like the last audience I'm going to be in front of before that audition. So you're actually giving me a really good opportunity to practice my audition song. Okay. okay. So and it actually, this is fate and kismet. It ties into my talk. See now you're thinking she's an audience plant because. The song that I wanted to sing for my audition is from Miss Saigon. Those of you who know that musical, it is set in 1975 in Vietnam. And a young soldier who is just about to leave the country, uh, and as a going away presence, his buddies get him a night with a concubine, with a whatever, yes, with a, with a prostitute. And um, this is the song he sings that evening. <clears throat> Why does Saigon never sleep at night? Why does this girl smell of orange trees? 
Why does this feel good when nothing's right? Why is she cool when there is no breeze? Vietnam, you don't give answers, do you, friend? Just questions that don't ever end. Why God? Why today? I'm all through here on my way. There's nothing left here that I'll miss. Why send me now a night like this? Who is the girl in this rusty bed? Why am I back in a filthy room? Why is her voice ringing in my head? Why am I high on her cheap perfume, Vietnam? Hey, look, I mean you no offense, but why does nothing here make sense? Why, God, show your hand? Why can't one guy understand? I've been with girls who knew much more. I never felt confused before. Why me? What's your plan? I can't help her. No one can. I like my memories as they were, but now I'll leave remembering her. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go to the library, everyone. Thank you, Brad.